I guess that was the first urine bandit to hit motor cars of Georgia. So I can't say that my first day selling cars was quite as successful as Rabbit's, but I did sell a car on my first day. It wasn't anything terribly exotic. It was a BMW 650 convertible. It took a few more days for me to sell my first Lamborghini, and even though that was a stick mercy, it wasn't exactly the kind of car that you were super proud to be representing. It had giant Forgiato wheels and this huge aftermarket wing and a bunch of other stuff on it, just not the nicest example and not what you're just super proud to sell. But I, a few days after that, I sold out kind of our first you know, core product. It was a 2009 Gallardo LP560, a matte white car, one of two that they brought into the U.S. that year. Bianco Cannabis, Lamborghini called it. A big sticker car, super awesome. And I actually sold it to an NBA veteran. He played over 10 years in the league and wasn't really like a household name, but sort of a player to be named later in a whole bunch of trades, played for a bunch of different teams and made the league minimum for a lot of years, millions of dollars playing basketball. Super cool. So it was an awesome deal. I was really happy to sell him that car. He came in and loved it and, uh, you know, drove it away that day. And that night, my wife and I went out to celebrate and he actually drove right past us on our way to dinner. And I, I flagged him down and said, hey man, awesome, I'm glad you're enjoying the car. And he was over the moon, just absolutely loving it. And uh, the next day was my day off, and I was kind of early enough in my car sales career that I thought you actually took your days off. I mean, generally, you work one or two days on the weekend, so one of the weekdays you'll have is your day off, but generally, you don't take it. And the reason for that is what happened the day I went back to work. I walk into the showroom, and the car's right there. And so I'm like, guys, what happened? He said, well, he came back yesterday and fell out of love with the color and wanted this Grigio Telesto brand new car that we had. And so we sold it to him and took this back in on trade. And obviously I got no credit for the deal, didn't make anything on it. You know, it's just a miserable dog eat dog world that you, you got to learn some ways. And so I was a little bit upset about that, but I maintained the relationship with the client. And actually a couple of months later, I sold him another car. I sold him a BMW M6. He traded in his daily driver CL63 at the time. And it, it took a long time to do the deal and actually he brought in this English bulldog puppy that he said he'd bought the day before and flown in from Germany. It was like $5,000 dog and the dog was obviously not housebroken. It was peeing all over the showroom and he didn't really seem bothered by this so I had a porter that had to follow the dog around cleaning up after it while we negotiated this car deal and I guess that was the first urine bandit to hit motor cars of Georgia. So we, he ends up buying this car and it just takes forever. Probably an hour, two hours after we should have closed we finally get everything worked out and he and the dog and the car car leave. And he had said at the time that he wasn't just loving the Lamborghini, he kind of wanted something a little bit more comfortable, and we had just gotten the Aston Martin franchise. And as a dealership, when you get a new franchise, the manufacturer just floods you with inventory. So we probably had 25 new but aging Aston Martins that were strange color combinations or you know bad options or high stickers and really hard to sell. And we were trying to sell through them and the, the manufacturer was just leaning on us to hit numbers each quarter. And so around the end of June in 2010, we had this DBS Volante and it was a quantum silver over Tuscan tan car. And Tuscan tan is kind of Aston Martin speak for gray poupon mustard yellow. It's kind of a strange color, but quantum silver is gorgeous. Obviously it's a color from Quantum of Solace, the Bond movie. Even though Casino Royale and Quantum of Solace are scripted to be moment to moment sequential, the color of the car actually changes between the films. And so Quantum's a great color. And I, he had seen that car a couple of times and I called him and I said, hey, why don't you bring the guy on up? Let's see if we can work out some sort of a trade deal. And so he does and we go back and forth for a long time. He just loved to drag negotiations out and seem really hard and like he was trying to make us work harder. But eventually we'd get him to wherever we needed to be. Sometimes it just took a really long time. And so as you usual this was a Friday it just drug on and on after we should have closed at 7 we probably finished at about 8 30 and of course he didn't bring the title to the Lamborghini and he can't go authorize a wire transfer or get a certified check so he says Ed will y'all take a personal check for this thing and I'm like well it's not my call but I'll certainly go ask so I go ask my general manager I said hey obviously you know, he didn't bring the title but he wants the car do you want to take a personal check for the difference and he said sure I mean this guy's an NBA player made a lot of money he's bought a bunch of cars I mean I'm, I can't imagine anything will go wrong so you know, back then we wrote temp tags and on these iridescent strips, handwritten on these paper tags. So I put one on the car and about 8.30 he leaves on Friday night. So the next day, Saturday morning, I get in the office and I shoot him a text. I know he doesn't wake up until 12 or 1 and I say, hey, you know, let me know if you want me to send somebody down to grab that title or if you're going to bring it in, you know, how we can help. And I hope you're loving the DBS. And I, we get carried away with selling cars that day and I don't hear anything back. And so as we leave, my boss is like, all right, just make sure you get it on Monday. We'll, we'll get it all sorted out. So 
Monday I get in, I call him, and I don't get an answer. And we deposit the check and, you know, just assume that at some point he's going to bring this title. But nothing to get too freaked out about at that point. But later that day, he calls me back and he says, Hey, Ed, I'm sorry. I had to go run out of town for a few days. I'll be back like Wednesday, Thursday, and I'll bring you that title. I said, Well, that's not what you said. He said, Yeah, I'm sorry. I just, I had to go. Sorry about that. And so I tell my boss, and I'm like, I don't know what we can do. I mean, I, I don't know how else we're going to get the title. He said, All right, well, we'll just see when he gets back. So a few days later, we get a call from our bank and they say that the check had bounced. Insufficient funds. And I'm still trying to get in touch with him. He hadn't brought the title. And at this point, he's you know not answering. And while he says he's out of town, we keep seeing the car pop up on a website called Chasing Exotics. And Chasing Exotics was a website that Doug DeMuro started and used to run before he became an automotive journalist. And it was an exotic car spotting website, mostly in Atlanta and Hong Kong, of all places. But a pretty interesting thing. And so we saw the car showing up around Atlanta, so we knew he was in town and driving it. And so I keep trying to call him, ask him what's going on, and we get nothing back. And so finally I get in touch with him. He's like, oh man, I'm sorry. I deposited some money. I thought it would hit. I'm sorry that didn't clear. I'll send a wire or you know, bring you a check tomorrow. Uh, tomorrow comes and... He doesn't show up, doesn't answer. And so after a few days, my boss steps in and calls him and goes from zero to high order insanity immediately. And it's like, you stole this car. I'm going to send the police after you. I've got repo men looking for it. You're, you know, you're going to jail, all this craziness. And obviously the guy just shuts down, stops answering the phone and, and won't talk to the, my GM anymore. I'm like, oh goodness, what are we going to do here? And so I, you know, I kind of try to play the good guy. You know, obviously Aston Martin hostage negotiation is not something you sign up for, but in these situations where there's nothing really I can do to make it any worse, but there is a chance that I could help lead to a better outcome, it's the perfect opportunity to kind of show that you're a team player and that you can do things beyond the normal skill set that would be expected of somebody in your position. And so I keep talking to him and trying to offer different options like, do you want to find a cheaper Aston or finance the difference? I mean, what can we do to help? Because I mean, obviously I knew he had the title to the Lambo somewhere, but he just was clearly not ready to proceed with the deal. And it just drags on and on and we're not getting much help from the cops and the repo men can't really get into the community because it's gated and we're not exactly sure where he's at. And so we're just kind of at a stalemate for days, turning into weeks and going over a month. And so after about 35, 40 days, his temp tags expired. He can't drive the car anymore. He's not responding to my GM, but occasionally I'll get something back from him. And finally, I get him to say, hey, you can come meet me for dinner and we'll talk about this. So I asked my general manager, I'm like, what do you want me to do? I mean, I don't, I don't, I don't know what to negotiate with this guy on. He said, well, we're not having any luck with the cops or anything else. And this was a lot like some of the stolen rental car situations where it's really more of a civil matter and you know who has it. So it's not like a all points bulletin, be on the lookout sort of thing. So there's not much help they offer with multiple jurisdictions being involved. And he's like, all right, well, just go to dinner, see what you can figure out. So I show up and it's this guy and his entourage and He's like, man, I don't know. I thought I had this money coming in. I'm sorry. I just, I, I don't know what to do now. I drove the car a little bit. I just, I think I just want you to give me the money that you were going to give me on trade for the Gallardo, and then I'll just give you the Aston Martin back. And I'm like, well, problem with that is an over allowance. And sometimes when somebody won't take what their trade's really worth, you pretend to give them more and you just don't discount the other side as much as you really are. And so where the car might've been worth 150, 160 grand, we probably showed him 180 or 90. And so he thought his car was worth a lot more. And I had to tell him, well, if we take the profit of this car out of the deal, we have to give you what your car is really worth. And I don't know if they still want your car, but I'll, I'll try. He's like, all right, well, if you can get him to write me a check for that, I understand what it's really worth then I'll give you the Aston Martin back and give you the title. So the next morning I go back into the office and I'm like, all right, this is what he agreed to. And they're like, no, I'm not buying that car. I don't want to see it anymore. I'm not doing anything else with this guy. I'm like, well, that's fine. I, I don't know what else to offer. I just believe he will perform to this agreement because he said it and it's, it's right now for us to go and do. And finally, like, all right, just whatever. It's the only hope we have to get this car back amicably or reasonably amicably. Go get it. I went down with a porter. He drove me down so I could drive the DBS back. I got the title of the Lamborghini. He signed it. I got the DBS. Fortunately, it was no real worse for wear. I think he'd driven it 350, 400 miles. Nothing too terrible. I think he curbed a wheel or two, but again, nothing that can't be easily fixed. So fortunately, it's kind of resolved. I take the car back. We re-PDI it and get it listed for sale again. And we, we never heard from this customer anymore, unfortunately. But we sold his Gallardo to a really good customer up in Tennessee. And he owned a bunch of interesting cars and loved it. It was a really good deal on a barely used uh, Gallardo LP560. And 
you know, we kept the DBS and, you know, we got more incentives back from Aston, but it wasn't really eligible for those because we'd had to punch it when we thought we had it sold because they were leaning on us to sell more units that quarter. And we thought it was sold and it took several days for the check to bounce. And so we weren't eligible for the greater rebates and incentives that came down the road. It sat around for another seven months. And actually the same guy that bought the Gallardo ended up buying the DBS for his wife. And they'd had other DBSs in every awesome car and he loved it. Drove it for a little while and actually found out that in 2016, the car got exported to the Netherlands. That's one of the things we love about Venwicky is the chance to kind of see what happens to cars kind of after they fall out of touch or you don't know where they've ended up. And sometimes those days where you learn the most about the car business are not the best financially. The little commission they'd paid me on the not terribly profitable deal where we'd sold this DBS in the first place got charged back and I never got any thank you or anything for having recovered it. But you know, on those days where you don't get the recognition or the praise that you think you might deserve, at least you end up with a really good story to show for it. And honestly, what more could you ask for? Then Wiki is proud to be partnering with Mobile App Hero to continue changing the way we look at documenting automotive history. We're working with them to bring updates to our mobile and web-based app. So stay tuned to their social media and ours and keep telling the stories of all the cars you love.